A few years ago, the United Nations has pointed out that the number of refugees and displaced people has reached the highest level ever recorded since the aftermath of World War II. And in the last 20 years, more than 45,000 migrants have drowned, and most of them in the Mediterranean. And there's more terrible news on the suffering of people during migration that reach us almost every day through the news. I would like to welcome you all on behalf of the Göttingen Literature Festival, the Literaturherbst, and also on behalf of the Max Planck Institutes here at Göttingen. It is really great that you join us today to discuss a very important topic, actually pressing issues on migration and borders and we will discuss those issues in particular in the light of the ongoing coronavirus pandemic. Our guest today is a world leader in research on migration and borders. She's director at the Max Planck Institute for the study of religious and ethnic diversity here at Göttingen. She's also professor of law and of political sciences at the University of Toronto. Furthermore, she's a fellow of the Royal Society of Canada, and just a year ago, she obtained the Gottfried Wilhelm Leibniz Award, which is the highest research award in Germany. I'm very happy that she's with us today, and I would like to welcome Ayelet Chacha. Thank you so much. Great to have you with us today. A pleasure to be here. A few months ago, Ayala Chacha has published a very remarkable book on the shifting border. You see it here. The book shows not only that people are moving, we all know this, but also that borders have the capacity to move. And that may actually sound uh, very unfamiliar to many of you. It certainly did to me when I first heard her talk. I think this was in Berlin at the Hanak House at a Max Planck event. And then I read the book over the summer and I was really taken by it. Um, I didn't realize that around the world, borders have begun to move and we will learn today how this is working. Ayelet has used the US, Canada, and Australia, as well as the European Union, in this book as examples to show that these borders are becoming more and more adjustable legal constructs. And often they are made to limit unwanted immigration. But today, Ayelet Shahar will focus on the shifting border in the light of the ongoing pandemic. I guess only about half a year ago or so, many of us would probably not have imagined how quickly even the countries around us would suddenly close national borders and um, change the regulations for these borders. But before we start, I would like to invite you all to ask questions. You can use this little window in your browser to type in any question uh, to pose it to ILAT, and we will actually collect those questions during the talk, which will be for about half an hour or so, but then we will have another half hour where we discuss the topic, and then also your questions will be posed to our guest. Now I'm very much looking forward to your talk, ILAT, please. Wonderful, thank you so much. 
Good evening, everyone. Guten Tag. It's such a pleasure uh, to be here and in this beautiful space uh, around us. We wish you could join us in person, but we're uh, very delighted uh, to uh, communicate with you through the live uh, stream. So thank you so much, uh, Professor Cromwell, for this wonderfully generous introduction. And it's such a pleasure uh, also to thank the Literature Festival and, of course, the various Max Planck Institutes and all my, my colleagues uh, there. So my talk today, as you heard, is based on my new book, The Shifting Border, Legal Cartographies of Migration and Mobility. And the book was published literally uh, days before the current pandemic. And I just have a, a photograph here on the screen. This was taken on the first day that I received my first two copies, March 9. Now, as you may recall, just literally days after that, the borders started to close down. So I was actually very fortunate, and I was lucky that we had someone who took the photograph. This is in, our, in my institute, uh, in uh, my office. Now, in the short time that uh, we have together, uh, what I would want to do is really introduce you to the first part of the book, and I'd like to take you with me on a journey, uh, and a journey that explores how the classic, very classic tools of public law, which I mean to refer to legislation, regulation, uh, court decisions, how all of these tools have become very powerful, very significant in reinventing one key dimension of sovereignty in the modern world, namely how we think about borders and territoriality. And I'll divide my talk into three parts. So first, I'll just give you the gist of the argument, the core theoretical uh, contribution of the book. After that, I will try and go through the various uh, examples, uh, specifically three examples. I'll talk to you about uh, some developments in Canada, the United States, and Australia. Actually, I will start with the United States as my first example. And third and finally, I want to share with you some thoughts, some preliminary thoughts about borders uh, in the time of COVID-19. So obviously, the latter is very current, still developing, but I think also very, very uh, important for all of us to begin to think through these issues. So let us begin. Um, if I ask you to close your eyes and just imagine a border, what image would come to mind? Most of us, I suspect, would think of the border as a line, a line on a map, or we might think about it as some kind of a physical barrier. So you might think about a wall or you might think about a fence, but something very fixed, very fortified, sitting exactly on the frontier of a given country and planted firmly there. That's our classic image of the border, which in the book I refer to as the static border. That's the classic Westphalian way that we think about borders. And if you want to have some specific examples, think about the Great Wall of China, right? It's massive, it's big, we can see it. Actually, you can see it from space. And that is uh, one image of this thought of sovereignty as uh, being expressed through these powerful symbols that lay on a specific part of a territory and mark the end of one country, the beginning, of another. Uh, another example which would be very familiar uh, to our audience here is, of course, the Berlin Wall, which at the time, uh, uh, of course, uh, ran like a scar in the heart of a divided city. The Berlin Wall also was a very violent wall in the sense that you had the guards that would actually shoot anyone who tried to reach that border. Now, the second image of a border that I want to share with you, which I explore in the book, is actually the post-Berlin uh, Wall, that is post-1989 when but the Berlin uh, Wall came down, many people, actually many theorists, it's very interesting to read this now, looking back at what was written in the 1990s, many people had predicted that borders would soon uh, become relics, they would become memories, they would become something that belongs to a bygone era, and we will no longer, they would no longer affect the ability of individuals to cross, uh, at least across international borders. Now today we know that the, this second image of the border, which in the book I refer to as the disappearing border theory, that really never uh, materialized. That vision uh, never uh, really uh, had the same kind of power that the individuals who predicted it had thought uh, would come to bear. Instead, what we find today is a very different reality. So first of all, we do find that new walls are being built. So instead of no longer having walls or borders disappearing, we find that throughout the world there are roughly 70 borders now that are built on international borders, either built or being completed. 
But, and this is the contribution of this book, I want to suggest that at the same time, just as uh, these uh, border walls are being built, there's actually a new and, and really striking trend that has emerged, and that's the rise of very sophisticated, invisible borders, borders that rely on very shrewd, on very sophisticated legal techniques that crea create a whole new conception uh, of the border, the shifting border, which is the topic of my book. Now, unlike the physical fixed border, the static border that we started with, the shifting border is not fixed in time or in place. Instead, it's a border that we can think about it as a border in, in flux. It's a border that moves. It's a border that is mobile. And because it is mobile, it may penetrate very deep into the interior. That would be my first example with the United States, but other countries have used the same uh, range of techniques, France, for example. And also, it can stretch far, 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 far away. It can, you can actually meet the border if you're trying to arrive, say, to Germany. You might meet the border thousands of kilometers away before you even boarded a flight heading uh, towards uh, the European Union. So the border may stretch inward, outward, it may appear, reappear, disappear. So it's a much more flexible concept once the border is detached from a fixed uh, territorial uh, marker. And that's really the most striking finding that I had in this research, that the border itself has become a moving barrier, an unmoored legal construct, and therefore the fixed black lines, which we still see on our atlas books, they're still there and countries still have a beginning and an end. It's just that for migration regulation purposes, for regulating mobility, and especially as we heard, regulating or, or really restricting the ability of unwanted wanted or uninvited migrants to come in, states have really taken the idea of the shifting border, and, and at least in principle, the border now could apply anywhere, anywhere in the world, because again, it's no longer tied to a specific territorial uh, marker. And I want to suggest to you that these developments are very significant for us to think about because they really challenge some very basic assumptions that we have. They challenge the idea of, as I mentioned earlier, waning sovereignty, disappearing borders, the demise of states. Uh, all the evidence that I bring in the book actually runs counter to that. States uh, have not uh, been weakened, if anything, uh, acting alone or in concert or with supranational entities or in sometimes with private actors. They have enhanced uh, their powers. So uh, that's one of the major uh, findings that I have in the book. But the other thing that the shifting border uh, teaches us is that a lot of the political rhetoric, which we are all familiar with, say, think, for example, of the United States, of President Trump and his discussion of uh, building the fortified border on the US-Mexico border and a lot of the nationalist populist move to refortify borders, it matters symbolically, it matters politically, but in terms of how migration is regulated, a lot of it is actually done not at all at those physical borders, but as I will explain in a minute, before and after we enter a particular uh, territory. So what I want to do now is to share with you a couple of comparative examples to show you how uh, the shifting border actually operates. And I also uh, want to explain to you that what has really changed is the location of the border. And it's significant because if you are a migrant, if you're an asylum seeker in particular, trying to enter a particular country, and you are blocked from entering far, far away from that country, uh, this small change, the location, the fact that you're not stopped at the territorial border, but before that has very dramatic implications for the kinds of rights and protections that migrants and non-citizens uh, may enjoy. And later on, when we get to talk to COVID, I'll explain to you why these migration techniques or regulatory techniques that were once limited to people on the move, especially people who are escaping poverty, persecution, instability, uh, today everyone, even citizens in very uh, wealthy countries, uh, are actually increasingly subject uh, to the shifting border and its ever-expanding reach. And in the global pandemic, we've seen a real acceleration of this trend. Okay, so let's move to our examples. The first example that I want to share with you comes for us, uh, to us from the United States. And here, as part of a major uh, reform uh, to U.S. immigration law and regulation, a procedure called expedited removal was introduced. Now, this legal provision 
actually was a tiny, tiny sentence, really, in a very, very long uh, statute and a very long uh, piece of legislation that was introduced. And frankly, I think no one really even noticed it. Um, but expedited removal, as the name indicates, what uh, this procedure did is it allowed border agencies to very um, quickly, expeditiously return individuals if they reached the territorial uh, border. But another thing which was introduced very quickly thereafter uh, was again, some very small regulatory change, saying that expedited removal no longer just applies at the territorial or coastal border of the United States, what you see here on the map, on the slide, but it can also apply to any individual detected uh, within 100 miles from any US land or coastal border, and that's the orange rim that you see here. Uh, in effect, moving the border from its fixed location at the external uh, boundary into the, territorial, uh, into the territory of the United States, into the interior, and that is uh, the shifting border that I will now describe to you in terms of its implication. So what the legal, uh, the shifting border, what this orange rim does, the fact that the border has now moved into the territory in the United States, creates, not only relocates the border, that is it moved, but it also creates uh, what has been referred to as the constitution light or constitution free zone within the United States. Remember now we are already within the territory, we're no longer on the international border. And what this change uh, permits now law agencies or law enforcement agents is to set random checkups, uh, to set checkouts without any what in law is called probable cause, without any reason to think that there's any suspicion about an individual, you're permitted to put these uh, random checkups on highways, on ferry terminals, on trains, uh, pretty much anywhere on the road, um, and ask every person to show proof of their uh, ability to remain in the country, to show that they have a legal status in the United States that permits them to remain. Now, we typically are asked to show a passport when we cross a border, physical border, when we actually uh, enter a country. But uh, this is familiar, but what's not familiar uh, for us is that such governmental power of surveillance of our movement and mobility now is spilling into the interior. It may occur anywhere within that 100-mile uh, zone. Now, you might say, how does it really matter in such a big country? Does it matter that you stretch the border for 100 miles into the interior? How is that significant? Well, if that's what you're thinking, I would actually urge you to think again. I'll do so because the most recent census data from the United States tells us that within this orange rim, there are actually quite a few major cities and two thirds of the US population resides within this uh, constitution free or constitutional light zone. Another way to slice the data is this, 200 million people reside in the malleable, movable border uh, zone. Uh, if you want to think about specific states, the bulk of the state of New York lies within these uh, 100, uh, the 100 mile zone. Uh, the state of Florida and many other states that have a very large migrant population, again, would fall within this 100 mile zone, the orange uh, image that we have here. And the governmental agency that's responsible for managing the shifting border in the United States, the Department of Homeland Security, or DHS, has gone on record already very early, in the early 2000s, uh, saying, stating that from their perspective as the Border Enforcement Agency, um, they believe that these measures may well expand nationwide. So in theory, the shifting border, the orange could now cover all of the United States. In fact, the Trump administration has created a rule that technically permits that. We can return to that uh, later on. But I want us to move to our second example. So here the border was bleeding into the territory. The second example that I'll share from you comes from uh, my home country of Canada. Canada, just geopolitically, just its location in the world is such that most people would actually have to fly in in order, you know, lots of water or a, a territorial border with the United States. But most people would have to fly into Canada if they wanted to enter. So the Canadian government has perfected a technique that it calls interdiction abroad. What is interdiction abroad? Interdiction abroad means that effectively Canada has relocated much of its immigration uh, control and regulation activities uh, to overseas uh, 
gateways. These gateways are located primarily in Europe and in Asia, where migration integrity officers, or sometimes they're called liaison officers, uh, now conduct border control activities as a matter of course. And they also delegate some of this work uh, to private actors, uh, such as airline personnel. So if you were to fly to Canada, your visa, your passport, all of that will be checked prior to embarking on a plane, not upon uh, arrival. So as, whereas in the United States, in the previous example that I discussed with you, we saw that the border shifted inwards. Here, the border shifts outwards. And if you again look at the um, diagram that we have here, in the image of um, the regulators, the ideal would be actually to find you at the country of origin before you start your journey, not at the last moment when you reach inland, when you actually re reach uh, the territory. And indeed, um, the idea here, and this is part of a strategy which is a, a declared by uh, Canadian authorities, by official documents, governmental documents, as, and this is just, a, I'm going to read this to you so you'll get uh, the language and a sense of what the shifting border is imagined here as doing. The idea is to push the border as far away as possible from the actual territorial border. So really, the governments are declaring, this is our idea, we want to push the border out, we want to stop people before they arrive. And this idea is also enthusiastically endorsed by other governments throughout the world. Um, the idea is to screen people at the source, at the origin, when they start their journey, rather than the end of the journey, that is when they reach the destination country. And then again, and you also see this, this, this is why we have the various uh, rings here, the idea is to check people at every possible point in their journey onward. This would mean that it's prior to arrival, visa screening, airport checking, points of embarkation, transit points, international airports, and then upon arrival once at the territory. So you can see, we started with the image of a fixed border, the border that actually lies at the territory. You can see how different that is. Because here, this territorial border, the static border, becomes the last point of encounter uh, where, rather than the first one. So this is really quite a dramatic change. And this I would refer to as the long arm of the state. It just reaches you much, much earlier in your journey in terms of time and also far away in terms of space, more distant from the territory itself. So again, just moving in the interest of time, I'm going to show you a third example. This is from Australia. In Australia, if you look at the image that we have here, even more explicitly and in some ways uh, really uh, in, in a way that I think no one would have imagined, say, uh, 20 years ago, um, Australia has really very explicitly, even more explicit than Canada and the United States, has officially relocated. It moved its borders through the words of law. So Australia is still Australia. The, 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 the geography is still there. Uh, the, the sovereignty of Australia still applies to its full territory. But what Australia did, and again, um, as its government officially uh, admits, is cr they created a distinction between the country's migration zones. Those are the yellow bubbles that you see here on the map. And Australia, the classic Australia as we would know it on the map. And this policy is sometimes referred to as the excision policy. And it was introduced through legislation initially in 2001 changed again in 2005, then again in 2013. And what this legislation does, it, it authorizes Australia's immigration officials to remove, to remove asylum seekers that have managed to reach its excision zone. So if you come by boat and you reach any one of these yellow areas, you're treated, although you physically arrived to Australia, Legally, you're treated as you have, if you have never, ever reached Australia. This is a pure legal fiction. That is, people are physically on the territory, but legally, they have never arrived. They never made it, actually, to the territory. And this matter is quite significant, because if you physically are on a territory, there are very significant procedural and substantive rights that asylum seekers would have, or any other irregular migrants, uh, if you reach the territory. And this is uh, grounded in domestic and international law. But if here, through legislation, Australia says, well, you're physically here, but you never really reached us. Those kinds of protections simply do not apply. So I mentioned earlier, this is the power of the words of law, the action of law, just signing a, a particular legislation with, with the sign of a pen uh, dramatically transforms, and in this case, really restricts very dramatically the rights that individuals have, I think, in a way that's, that's quite uh, disturbing. Um, and what Australia did is it's not only... Um, 
uh, took away these rights, it also eliminated uh, the possibility to actually bring your case before a court of law. So not just redrawing the territorial border, but also attenuating legality in the process as well. And just one last thing that I'll say about Australia, because it's such a dramatic um, example. In 2013, in this last uh, legislative change that I mentioned to you, uh, the excision zone, the yellow bubbles have been expanded again through a decision of uh, the, the Australian Parliament to include the whole territory, so the whole mainland of Australia. So if we actually wanted to get a current picture, everything should appear in this bright yellow color, meaning in effect that the border applies everywhere and nowhere. So you don't actually know where the border is. It's around you at all times. And again, with might have very dramatic implications in terms of the rights and protections that you might have. And also, if you want to ask me later on, I can tell you a little bit more about Australia because it also has an offshoring processing uh, solution or a way to address migrants. So people do actually reach the territory. So if they're physically there but legally not there, Australia had to move them somewhere else. Typically, if you see down here, either to Papua New Guinea or to Nauru, a tiny uh, island in the Pacific, um, where people are processed and really detained potentially for years until they get their uh, decision about their refugee status. And not only that, even if they have a valid claim, they cannot return back to Australia. So really, the, the shifting border for these individuals is like a black hole. You just enter and you cannot get out. You can never come back to that country that you were trying to reach. And Australia might resettle you to third uh, country. So really, this is a very dramatic um, um, example in terms of uh, the implications for human rights and for our basic protections. Um, so let me move quickly to the final part of my talk. I want to talk to you a little bit about COVID. And please ask me about these, questions, these issues uh, later on. So of course, um, COVID was, was new, no one planned for the pandemic. And I want to explore how some of the logic of the shifting, shifting border, which governments were already familiar with, given that they created it, how um, governments responded and what kind of techniques they took from the shifting border. So first of all, remarkably, and you see this here, by the end of March, March 31st, 2020, we had a situation which we never had uh, before. That is close to 200 countries um, have imposed either full or partial travel bans, uh, de facto countries, just as we as individuals are supposed to self-isolate, countries actually self-isolated at the national level. So basically, they banned either uh, inbound travel, people coming in, or outbound travel, and in some cases, uh, both inbound and outbound. And at the height of the uh, of the first wave, we actually had 90% of the global population. 90% of the global population was residing in countries that introduced these travel restrictions. And this is absolutely unprecedented. That is, we never had a point in modern history where so many individuals uh, were restricted uh, mobility. And I actually want to say this as a factual statement. I'm not saying it as, as an evaluative uh, statement because it could be that, you know, 100 years from now when historians of public health and epidemiology would look back, they might say, well, this is the first time that states have actually valued individual life sufficiently, so highly, that they thought it was worth closing uh, their borders. That is, we can say everyone's life was considered uh, worth saving, and for that reason, we saw these closures. Of course, we have to see, and we don't have the, 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 the ability to project 100 years from now, but at least in terms of democracy and equality, you could say this was a very special moment in the sense that at least the governments felt the obligation to protect their citizens in such a way. But importantly, for the shifting border context, the question is, how could this be done? That is, how could we move from a world where everyone is moving across borders into a world that sort of froze, that no one is moving across a border? And here, if we go back to the image that I asked you to think, the initial image of the static border, remember, that border applies when you actually get to the territory, and it's physical, it's a barrier. So in theory, if we were still working with that model, we would probably need you know, battalions of soldiers to move to the border border and close down the gates, or if we think about building walls, we would need people to carry sacks of cement and put them and really block people's ability. As we know, none of that has happened. And also, the, the closure happened very, very quickly, which you could not really do with these old techniques. Instead, what governments did is they built on the key rationale of the shifting border. That is, they regulated mobility from afar. They regulated people prior to arrival, before they had embarked on any plane or any boat uh, reaching or heading toward their respective country or jurisdiction. 
And also, and this is quite new, in the past, as I mentioned, we saw the shifting border apply mostly to individuals who had no documentation or asylum seekers or individuals who had no regular status who were trying to reach in. With the shifting border that is put in, in the COVID era, we are actually seeing that anyone, any one of us or any person who would try to cross a border would be subject to these kinds of shifting border regulations. So that's something that we have not had before. All incoming travelers uh, are subject to uh, the kind of review that occurs prior to arrival. Not only that, and this again is new, in some countries you'll be regulated even after you cross the border. So uh, just to give you one uh, concrete example, so if we look here at this bottom image, you see the wristband um, on that, that this individual has. This is a policy that Hong Kong and other countries have introduced. That is, upon arrival, they'll ask travelers, all travelers, citizens, non-citizens, irrespective, just by, based on the fact that they have arrived from another country, people would have to have this wristband, and it's connected to a, a GPS and their smartphone application that monitors your movement post-arrival, and each person, if you're in a hotel, you would have to walk your hotel room. In your home, you would have to walk your, uh, sort of the territory that you're permitted to be in. And basically, each person has a digital fence around them, and they have to stay within that uh, location for 14 days. So now the border follows us in time and in space within the quarantine time. Now, what does this mean for international mobility? And I'll take two more minutes, and then we'll move to the Q&A. Here, obviously, we're speculating. None of us know. So, and I don't have a crystal ball. I don't have an ability to tell you what the answers are. But clearly, we, I think what we can do in trying to project and predict the future here is really work with the past trends that we have seen and imagine or speculate how they might be implemented in practice here. So we're seeing, first of all, airports have become key players. I'll give you uh, two examples. Uh, Israel's Ben Gurion Airport, this is an airport that is already known for very strict uh, security protocols. So that airport is now in the process of creating what they have referred to as a seamless uh, check-in and seamless processes of arrival and departure. That is, the idea is that no human agent will be involved in the process. They're also developing these tiny robotic kind of machines that will just clean every surface just after you have been there to sanitize and to make sure that all of the terminal building remains, uh, in that sense, uh, sanitized and, and COVID-free. Uh, in addition to having the fever check, which uh, all airports now have introduced, that particular airport is trying to create a platform that will permit online, real-time uh, determination of whether individuals have already been tested uh, for uh, the virus. And the goal, and this is the goal shared by all actually airports currently, is to create what is referred to as corona f coronavirus-free transportation hubs. So the idea is to create bubbles in which we could travel and where uh, there would be uh, no concern about uh, the virus. Many airports in Europe have now introduced a requirement that passengers either uh, be tested prior to arrivals or bring a negative uh, COVID test with them or be tested immediately upon arrival, especially from a high-risk area. And in some cases, if you have a negative test, that would waive the quarantine uh, requirement. And again, this is very, very tricky because you have to do it exactly within 48 hours prior to your arrival. So you have to calculate this to get the result and then show it to your uh, prior to departure to your airline personnel. If you don't have it, or if they're not sure that it was done within the last 48 hours, they will just not allow you to embark on a plane, even if, even if you're a citizen and you're returning to your home country. So again, this is something new. We have never seen this before. And the question is, will this remain with us? Will we see this also post-pandemic? Very hard to predict. The only thing we know that post 9-11, for example, a lot of the intro new introduced uh, procedures with, which people thought would only be temporary have actually stayed with us. So it's quite possible that something that now seems like it's just a response to an emergency might remain with us. But again, we're purely in the realm of speculation. Another thing that I want to share with you is just a notion that many governments, even before the pandemic, uh, were really pushing uh, the idea of having uh, what I mentioned earlier, the idea that 
we would just have a future of travel without any passports, without any documentation uh, required. And this is an idea that really very different governments have been pushing. China, for example, the United States, Australia, the UK, the United Arab Emirates, Singapore. All of these countries imagine a future where people could travel and cross an international border without passports. So you might say, how could that be possible? Well, the idea here is that instead of carrying a document that uh, declares or verifies your idea, your identity, our bodies, our physical biometric uh, uh, perimeters will become our ticket of admission. Or of course, conversely, it w they will become, our body will become uh, the, the reason for denying us entry into a particular location if biometric borders expand uh, their reach. And this is the image that I have here on the board. This is actually from uh, Dubai International Airport, their Terminal 3. And what you see here, this gate that you see here is already operational in that airport. Currently, it's volitional. You have to give consent to walk through it. It's a pilot project for a biometric uh, border. This is called the smart tunnel. When you walk through the smart tunnel, you can't see it here, but there are 80 cameras which are built into that tunnel and they would take your iris scan and facial recognition. And actually here we have buildings. Typically they would have an aquarium setting, so fish are moving around, and your eye naturally is drawn. You cannot control it. And they do this because they want to get a better uh, scan, obviously. So if you manage to, if you walk through this tunnel, no passport is required, no human interaction is required, because that biometric information will be tested vis-a-vis -a, -vis a database which already has that information. So that might be the future of travel. All of us might walk through such smart tunnels in different air airports and in different locations. And if I just have one more minute, I want to share with you one example actually from the European Union and then I'll close. So a couple of years ago, the European Union uh, introduced again another pilot project which is called iBorder Control. And iBorder Control is actually a very sophisticated system which is designed to pre-screen individuals, incoming travelers, before they enter the EU. And individuals are required to perform, and here I'm just quoting, a short automated, non-invasive interview with an avatar, so it's a sophisticated artificial intelligence machine, and undergo a lie detector. And this iBorder uh, system is tasked with the responsibility first of verifying your identity to really know that you are who you're claiming you are, but also, and this is again new, to calculate a cumulative risk factor for each individual. And once that risk factor is determined, it will appear every time any future border that you would cross through, you would have that initial um, risk factor assessed. And of course, it may lead to further checks. In some cases, it may lead to denial of entry. And the iBorder avatar, this machine, the reason why it's so sophisticated is because it's the, 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 the technology that it uses is really designed to detect human deception. And again, it's looking for what are referred to as micro gestures. These are very subtle, nonverbal facial and bodily cues. You cannot you cannot lie because you cannot control these micro gestures. So again, this might be the future that we will all share. And here the shifting border is 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 changing, the territorial border is changing, not just by moving inward and outward, as I showed you in our first examples from the United States and Canada. Here it's also multiplying and it's fracturing. That is, each person, each one of us might in the future carry the border with us as we move across space and place. And this really is a new paradigm that's very, very different from the two images that we started with the static border or the disappearing border. And I want to close by leaving you with the following thought. That is, as all of these examples illustrate, uh, borders are not vanishing. So the disappearing border theory, just as I said, has not, uh, has not been fulfilled. This really, it was more of a prophecy. But if anything, what happens, what we're seeing is that borders are transforming, they're changing, they're metamorphosing. And the shifting border is at once multidirectional, it's slippery, but not in the transnational, open, tolerant variant which uh, people had imagined uh, after the fall of the Berlin Wall. I think instead what we're seeing is actually a darker, it's a much more restrictive orientation that has emerged. And far from this borderless world, that image that people had thought that we would see in the 21st century, we not only find that more and more walls are being built, and usually this is on, on the fault line of the haves and have-nots, but also we're seeing the rapid proliferation of these movable, 
legal barriers that are applied selectively, unevenly, with fluctuating degree, intensity, and frequency of regulation. And no longer a static border, the border has become a mobile and agile, sophisticated and ever-transforming legal construct, a shifting border which can be planted and replanted and taken away in different placed again in different locations with dramatic implications for the rights and protections of everyone, every one of us who falls under the remit of the shifting border. So thank you very much. I'm looking forward uh, to your questions. Well, thank you so much for this exciting talk and also giving us a glimpse of the future. I should say that um, if you haven't posed your questions, now is the time, because I will only ask one question and then it's up to the audience. Um, I would like to continue on the one interesting aspect on the surveillance, yes. so that countries actually uh, monitor the location of people. Um, I guess you don't even need such a sophisticated button because we all carry around smartphones and I guess technically it's already possible to track most people and as far as I understand South Korea has done something like that during the pandemic. So my question to you is in terms of um, um, legal you know, boundaries uh, isn't that a violation uh, against uh, international laws, against human rights? Um, how, how, how can we go about this? I, I think many people are super scared about the thought that your home country is monitoring your location right. or you travel somewhere and suddenly every step is monitored. Yeah, I think this is such a great question and frankly a very uh, current one because we know that governments are uh, obviously dealing with uh, a tremendous uncertainty uh, we're taking different measures. So right. I've described one, which is closing the border, but you're right in terms of tracking and tracing a tremendous spike. And this is actually quite interesting because different countries have taken different approaches in the sense of the balance between surveillance and uh, rights protections. So you're right, uh, South Korea, a lot of uh, East Asia has taken a very, very uh, surveillance oriented uh, approach that is saying, it's an emergency now, we need to track people. Uh, it's very efficient to use technology such as smartphones and related technologies and to basically know if you've come in contact with anyone who tests positive and then you'll get the information. And of course, for these uh, kinds of, of surveillance strategies, it's very significant if you are voluntarily signing up or if the government forces you, if it's mandatory, where is the information shared? Is it on your phone or does it go, so it's decentralized or is it centralized? Exactly. How long does it stay there? Exactly. And how long does it stay? Mm -hmm. uh, does it get erased? Does it get uh, correlated with other sources of data? So, for Can example, it be sold maybe yeah. even to Starbucks. <laughs> You're right. No, it's extremely. Yeah. This is a very scary uh, future. I totally agree. We know that initially the European countries, which actually typically Europe has a very strong uh, privacy protection, uh, right. and it's known for that. Um, so, for example, what many governments initially did is they took what's referred to as metadata from telecommunication companies. So they didn't even need your consent. It was not, they didn't need you to sign to an app. Uh, but that's anonymized and it's actually turned out to be not as efficient as thought. Within the European Union, there's a diversity of, of mechanisms. I think Poland is the most interesting example um, because there they have certain apps for tracking and tracing. But if you are obliged to be quarantined for 14 days, then it's a different app and then you don't have a choice. You have to actually upload it. And it's not only geolocating you, it also has facial recognition. Mm -hmm. So this is really pushing the boundaries. And you're right, then of course we're worried about uh, privacy, proportionality. We're worried about uh, you know consent. All of these issues uh, become very central. And the truth is we don't know. This is such a moving target. But again, my worry here is that because we know from past experience that once the baseline changes, once the technology is there, and once the legal regulation that permit this are there, it's very hard. It's like a genie. You can't really put it back into the box. So I think, yeah. you know, for our audiences and for everyone who's worried about this, this is something that will require um, 
some kind of response. That is, it will, if, if people are worried about this, they should express this. They should find a way democratically to, to uh, raise these, these issues. Because otherwise, if there's no uh, res resistance or response, then yeah. governments could feel much more comfortable yeah, doing that. I imagine that very often the technology advances much more rapidly than uh, or legal regulations. It absolutely. takes longer to come up with the right You're absolutely right. And also, you know, it's not just happening out of thin air. I mean, the, high, the technology firms are very excited about this opportunity, right? First yes. of all, because they like data. Data is sort of their life, right? The more data they have, the more they can advance the technology. But also because now it's, it's such a, a tremendous way in. So it's, it's, you know, we have new players mm -hmm. and you're right. It's sometimes we're not sure if the governments are really leading or they're just following or they just trying to find any kind of solution. Or sometimes you, as a leader, you might also just need to say, I did something, right? To yes. say in the face of a crisis, I was yes. able. But again, I think this is such a totally open future and yeah. we definitely need to be very vigilant. Needs to be defined. Absolutely. Now, it's up to the audience to ask questions. And again, we have Elisa here. Um, Elisa, is there activity on the net? Do you see questions coming in? Yeah, there are a lot of uh, interesting questions again. So, okay. um, yeah, I would just start with the first one. So, you talked about the Berlin Wall uh, as a violent border. Do you think borders become more violent these days again? Oh, it's such a good question. It's a difficult one. The countries that I was observing, uh, specifically, if you notice, there, uh, there were the United States, Canada, Australia, and the EU and its member states. These are all countries that uh, claim to be uh, leaders of human rights. They're democratic, they're liberal. And what uh, these countries are doing, and again, I emphasize this in the book, they are... Um, again, with the exception sometimes of this administration in the United States, but the general trend has been that they have not pulled back from their human rights obligations or constitutional obligations. So, for example, with asylum seekers, even Australia, the most extreme example I showed you, Australia doesn't say that it's not following international law. They're just saying this is our interpretation. So they're really pushing the boundaries. They're operating sort of on this very fine line of saying we are still committed, and of course we are leaders of the world in terms of human rights, but de facto they're really actually breaching rights. So they're playing this is a very delicate game. I actually see this as an opportunity to resist because if states would say, well, we're just, we don't care and we're just going to shoot people, it's a very different uh, situation than states saying, oh, we're democratic. The European Union definitely says we're for democracy, for human rights, for rule of law. Therefore, this is a way, again, to just say, well, your actions are not similar to your words and, and it opens up a space for resistance. But on the question itself, most of these borders have not been violent in the sense of shooting people, but we do know that some of the pushbacks de facto might be sending people uh, to torture, might be even in extreme cases sending people back to death. So you can harm people even if you're not just pointing a gun at them. And I think this is a great worry in the world in which we reside, in which we live. We know that uh, we heard the Mediterranean people drowning on their way here, but potentially also when they're pushed back. Do you remember that there were actually with COVID, there were some concerns about Malta and Greece pushing back um, individuals and potentially with the Turkey-Greece border again, uh, there were some reports. I, have, I can't verify them. I don't have any direct record, so I can't say anything other than what was reported in the media. But we are concerned about the potential of violence. But I think countries are trying to, they're trying to avoid that. So they're trying to not have an explicit wall with guards that would shoot. That would really counter everything that they're saying. Uh, they're really trying to play this game, which I think is really a tricky game. But as I said, if we're trying to be optimistic, you could say that gap is exactly the place to hold countries to account and to say you cannot do this. You cannot create these consequences without holding holding up to your own obligations to protect individuals. And I really think that's the way forward, to just say human rights need to follow the border wherever it encounters, whenever, wherever the border reaches you, you should have some protections. Otherwise, we are just out of the rule of law context. So I, I would think that's the way to, to sort of try and push back against these kinds of developments. Um, which of the countries you studied had the most drastic change in its border? and immigration laws, excluding the COVID time? 
Oh, and again, another great question. I think they all had different transformations, so I can't say that one was more dramatic. Well, I would say Australia is the most uh, dramatic in the sense that it really just invented this whole new idea that certain parts of a territory no longer count as the country for immigration regulation purposes. So I think that is really extreme. Uh, and also the consequences of, of offshore processing are extreme. But I would say even Canada and the United States and the European Union, which has been very active in terms of a policy that the EU and EU member states called externalization. So again, the border might reach you uh, at the beginning of your journey, which might be in Mali or somewhere deep in Africa when you're heading towards uh, Europe or towards Italy or, or, or Greece or Malta or what have you, or Spain. Um, so those kinds of changes are also quite dramatic. So I have to say all of this is just such a, it's a shifting border. It's conceptually something new. And I think that was really what I was trying to do in this book, just to give us a way to talk about these multiple changes under one heading. And I think that's significant because otherwise you might see only the dots, right? Only the trees. And I was trying to say, no, it's really a forest. And once we give it a name, we can actually put all these dots together and then potentially respond to them. Okay, okay. so maybe one physiological question in the end. Do you think building borders is something natural for human beings, even for nomads? Wow, that's a great question. I, I have to say I have not done the research going back to nomads, so I, I can't really say. Um, it's possible that it is, a, it depends on how we think about our communities, and I think this is how I would tie it back to borders. We do know that um, we don't yet have, and there probably was never a period where we had just a global community where everyone was included. There might have been theories, cosmopolitan theories, that said we need to think about everyone else uh, all humans, and in some cases even non-humans, as belonging to one large community. But the minute that we have different sub-communities, that is that we belong to smaller groups or in our current uh, reality, to nation states, then to some extent, once you have the distinction of the inside and the outside, you have to have legal rules of who's included, who's excluded. So this is partly what citizenship and immigration are doing all together. And the border itself is just a manifestation, a physical manifestation marking that point and also marking the question of can you cross or not cross. So I hope that answers the question. I think once we have communities and, you know, even peaceful communities might still have uh, some borders or uh, fences between them. So it's even, and, and they might be open all the time, but what we saw with COVID, which I think was really unprecedented and no one I, I really no one working in my field would have predicted it the idea that even within the EU the internal borders would return unprecedented and, and, and really unimaginable almost and and it happened like this so quickly and we're hoping it will not happen again in the second wave but just to say even if these borders become dormant, even if they are really removed for the purposes of, of mobility and standard times, almost all pieces of legislation and regulation and even international treaties that I'm familiar with have what's referred to as an emergency clause. So when something really dramatic happens, you might have an exception. And this is precisely what was used in this context with COVID for returning the borders even within the EU. But you know, there was also a push to, to remove those very quickly once it became possible in early June. So I think Hopefully, we will not see that again, but the potential is there, and that, I think, uh, speaks to the question that you raised. Many thanks. Thank you. Well, thank you, Elisa, and especially, of course, thanks to our audience for these interesting questions. Um, I have another one now coming Please. You know, back to what we talked about in the very beginning in a more global sense, thinking about migration, all the you know refugees, the many crisis we have. Um, you have a very interesting example in your book uh, from Canada from the year 2015. And there you say, and I, I didn't know this, it's quite e exciting to know that this is possible, that um, in the light of a crisis they would actually be able to conduct the asylum application process within the crisis region and they would be able to relocate refugees or to take up refugees, I think even 25,000 yeah. refugees, very rapidly. Yeah. And, I mean, isn't that a beautiful example of how it could be done if you really wanted to help those people who are in need? And what is your prediction? Will there be any other countries following this example? That's, uh, thank you for that. I really appreciate it because it's a great question. And, and I did use this example, so I'll explain it a little bit. And I think... You're absolutely right to mention it because 
what I like about this example, it was actually initially started with 25,000. At the end, Canada actually brought in more than 50,000. So it was even larger than the initial uh, idea of the intake. But what the reason why I included the example in the book is, of course, it was related to the migration crisis which in 2015, which was, of course, dramatic for many countries. Uh, but the European countries, the difference was that individual actually walked and reached those countries. Canada, just again, given its geolocation, people couldn't really walk from from Syria and reach yeah. uh, Canada. It's just uh, impossible. Um, so what Canada did, and this is very interesting because the same technique, the shifting border technique that we typically see regulating mobility and stopping individuals, especially asylum seekers, the very same technique was actually here used to bring them in. And I think this is why you're raising it because the logic was exactly the same logic. Let's go to the point of origin rather than the point of destination or really it was refugee camps in, 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 in Lebanon and, and in Jordan. So it was not Syria per se. It was after people have left the country but were already uh, outside of the country in refugee camps. And there people were processed. You're right, the whole asylum process was done very, very quickly. So this is like expedited removal, totally expeditiously. Individuals, usually you need to get verification of identity. There are certain security um, checks that need to be done. All of that was done literally in a matter of weeks. And individuals also had the security once they were granted status. When they moved to Canada, they were flown, the Canadian government sent in planes and people were flown to Canada and already had a secure status. And if we compare this to Germany, which we all know in 2015 was extremely generous in terms of saying, come here, you're permitted to file your application. But it was file your application. No one would say you're automatically considered a refugee. You still had to go through the review process and that can take years in certain cases and your status might not be secure. So it's also very different in the sense that the individuals who moved to Canada already knew that they had the status. They had this protection for their identity, for their sense of self. They already knew that they were going to be resettled. And once they were resettled, they could stay in that new country. Now, the question of whether other countries will follow, I think it's a technique that's already there. So, and there were years where actually Australia and the US used, they did not send their own uh, officials to the, um, to say refugee camps. They relied on the High Commissioner for Refugees, so on their screening, but they did what's referred to as resettlement. So they would bring in people again with the security of status. Another thing that this permits is you can actually um, this is again the UN criteria. You would look at the people who are most vulnerable uh, and try and grant them status first, protection first. Whereas the current system that we have, we're actually asking individuals to do something uh, which is difficult, not just from the perspective of states, but also the perspective of the, of the individual. You're the one who has to cross, and in many cases without permission. So you have to get human smugglers. You have to go through a very, very, really terrible journey, a dangerous journey. Uh, people have been harmed on the way. And I think if we had to imagine a system, would we say, you first have to go through this only to get protection? Or would we say, why not think about bringing protection to where the individuals who are in need? So I think our current system, in addition to it being uh, politically very contested. It's also in some deep ways. It's like a fittest survive. We ask you to run and, and cross, uh, you know, the, the Mediterranean, or we ask you to climb through mountains, or we ask you to go in the United States through the desert until you reach the border. Why is this our humanitarian response rather than saying, isn't it better to try and bring safety and assistance to where individuals are? Now, it's complicated to do, and what you really need is much more international cooperation. So I think most people in the field would say, of course, it's possible, because even though the numbers are high, they're not uh, incredibly high, right? Even in the height of the uh, crisis, the 2015, we had more than a million people entering a union with over 500 million people. So you could say it's possible. It's just what people respond to, and I think this is really uh, contested uh, politically, is people in all countries, even in very welcoming countries, are very worried about the idea that people can just come in without having a sense of, is there a numerical limit? Are there certain principles? Why can't we screen individuals prior to arrival? So I think if you're sensitive to this reality, to the fact that individuals respond very negatively to that, again, it would make sense to push the review. But I would still say when we think about borders, because they are um, so sometimes so difficult to cross and individuals might have very strong reasons to try and arrive to the border, I would always keep open the option for individuals to come in 
to physically arrive at a border and present themselves and present their case. But I think we should supplement that by other ideas. And the Canadian example in that sense is really a beautiful example because it worked, it was quick. And again, it was so interesting for me as a researcher because it was exactly the same techniques, you know, operate prior to arrival, far away, but instead of restricting rights, it actually granted rights. And that's partly my idea in the book, or one of the ideas that I put forward. Why not use, if we already have this technique, and I don't think that states would take it back. So that train has sort of left the station, in my opinion. Do they listen to you at the United <laughs> Nations? It would be so great to, you know, if the United Nations would somehow have a working group to I, I would be try delighted. and follow up that example and yeah. see whether other countries are interested in Yeah, no, I think the Global Compact is going in that direction. And I think from my previous books, I've had ideas which some of them were even more uh, <laughs> you know, radical than this idea. And I had courts and, and in some cases, government uh, officials and, and definitely government commissions that were looking into that. So right. obviously, it, it's quite possible. That would be wonderful. Let, let's hope. <laughs> let's hope our listeners push for that as well. Right. Such an interesting topic and so many open questions. We could go on for another hour. I Easily. wouldn't finish. <laughs> um, but our time is over. So um, I always try to you know, learn by focusing during that hour on a, on a sentence that I would like to remember. And the one I would like to remember today is that you said human rights need to follow the border. I think this is a beautiful summary of, of the goal and the thing you're fighting for. And, and um, I think if we could help to reach this goal or get a little bit further along the way tonight, that would have been wonderful. Um, I would like to finish by uh, telling you that, as always, the book is available online. Uh, you can buy it online. You just follow the link on that uh, Literaturherbst website. Um, and I would like to also uh, invite those of you who haven't been here at the Paulina Kirche to see the beautiful photography exhibition by Helinde Kerbel, one of the famous um, German uh, photographers to, to come here. Entry is free. It's usually open in the afternoon. You will find the opening hours also on the internet. And I would like to invite you to come back. If you liked it tonight, um, please join us again on Thursday evening, uh, again 7 o'clock. And we will have another very exciting topic, and that is the most extensive um, expedition to the North Pole. We will have Markus Rex here, oh, who has been on the Polarstern, this um, research ship that went for one year uh, around the North Pole. So beautiful images, very interesting um, talk that we can expect on Thursday. Um, as always, also I would like to thank our camera team, the people who made it possible behind the scenes. It worked again beautifully, thank you so much. And of course, um, I will not close without thanking our guests again, Shahar. Uh, this was a wonderful evening. I learned a lot, and I'm, I'm sure many out there who watch this uh, are equally excited. And all the best to you and to your research and the whole team. Thank you so much for the invitation to Goodbye. be here. Goodbye. <laughs> Bye-bye. <laughs>